My wife's family tried to scam me after her death. So when they came begging for more, I made sure they paid the price. I'm Ethan, 41, and until recently, I was married to my wife, Sarah, who was 38. We were just a few months away from celebrating our 12th wedding anniversary, but she passed away about six weeks ago. Sarah had been battling leukemia for the past five years. She fought with everything she had, but I still lost her in the end. I was her primary caregiver throughout her illness, and I made sure to spend as much time with her as possible. Even now, I have no regrets, because I know I did everything I could for her. Before she got sick, Sarah was a writer. She wrote fiction and published a few novels that were moderately successful, but she mainly catered to a niche audience. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough to make a substantial living, so she switched to ghostwriting, which paid far better. She ended up making a good amount of money doing that. I run a small bookstore. It's not as lucrative as Sarah's work was, but it's enough for me to live comfortably. When Sarah passed, she left me most of her assets and savings, which amounted to around $750,000 after covering all her medical expenses. She also left $75,000 for her family, which, in my opinion, was more than they deserved, considering how they treated her. Sarah's family, which consists of her parents and two younger brothers, never really made much of an effort to be close to her. Even during her last days, they rarely visited. They'd call every now and then, but only when they needed money. She'd send it to them without hesitation, hoping that would bring them closer. But I think at some point during her time in the hospital, Sarah realized they didn't care as much as she thought they did. That's probably why she changed her will, leaving them much less than she originally intended. Her brothers, Mike and James, are in their late thirties. Mike manages their family-owned diner, and James works at a law firm. I've never really had much of a relationship with any of them, so I was surprised when they suddenly showed up at my place last week, saying they needed to discuss something urgent with me. I felt uneasy the moment they walked in. We'd barely spoken since the funeral, so it seemed strange that they would show up out of the blue. Once they were seated, they pulled out a stack of papers and shoved them at me, saying I needed to take a look. The documents were letters and notices from various people, all demanding payment for some supposed debt Sarah had racked up before she died. Apparently, since word of her passing had gotten out, these creditors were now coming after them, and they expected me to settle everything immediately. I was dumbfounded. As far as I knew, Sarah didn't have any debts. We were financially stable, and we never needed to borrow money. So this whole debt story seemed completely insane to me, dot. They explained that Sarah had run up these debts while living on her own long before we met. She had never paid them off, even though she could have. They claimed she made them promise to keep it a secret from me. Now, because the debt had supposedly accrued interest over time, the total amount was around $100,000. I didn't know what to think. Sure, Sarah had a rough period before we got together. She moved out of her family home and struggled to make ends meet while trying to establish herself as a writer. She took on tutoring jobs, worked at a diner, and barely managed to pay rent until her first book was published. But never once did she mention taking out loans or owing money to anyone, dot. It just didn't add up, dot. They wanted me to pay the entire sum in cash within a week. When I said I needed time to figure things out, they looked annoyed, but said nothing, and left. The next day I contacted Sarah's personal assistant, Anna. She'd helped Sarah with her finances and was privy to most of Sarah's affairs. When I showed her the documents, Anna looked as shocked as I was. She insisted Sarah didn't have any debts and definitely didn't owe anyone $100,000. Anna pointed out that the supposed creditors listed on the papers were all loan sharks. We had no way of verifying if these people were legitimate, since the documents were mostly letters with vague threats and warnings about what would happen if we tried to run. I thought about just giving Sarah's family the money and letting them deal with it, but something about the whole situation felt off, dot, so, comma. I decided to reach out to Sarah's cousin and closest friend, Lily. If anyone knew what was really going on, it would be her. When I told Lily about the debts, she laughed. There's no way Sarah owed anybody money, she said. She then dropped a bombshell. Those papers were probably fake. Sarah's parents had always been after her money. They didn't want her to become a writer and had kicked her out after she refused to get a real job. She struggled for years, working multiple jobs just to survive, dot, but she never took a loan, not a single penny. Lily was convinced that Sarah's parents were trying to scam me. She suggested that I refuse to pay them and see how they reacted. I agreed. The next day, I called Sarah's family and told them I wasn't going to give them any money. Instead, I'd deal with the supposed creditors directly, dot. The moment I said that, they flipped. 
They started yelling, accusing me of not trusting them, and insisted that the money had to go through them. Their anger only confirmed my suspicions. Something was definitely wrong. I contacted a lawyer to get the documents examined. Within a few days, he confirmed what I already suspected. Every single letter was fake. None of the people listed had ever loaned Sarah money. It was all a lie. I was furious. I couldn't believe they were willing to stoop so low just a few weeks after losing Sarah. It wasn't even about the money anymore. They had tried to make Sarah look like a liar and a cheat, someone who hid things from her own husband. If they had just asked me for help, I would have given it to them. But instead, they tried to con me. I'm done with them. I'm thinking of cutting them out completely and even suing them for the money Sarah left them. They don't deserve a cent, and I can think of several people who were actually there for Sarah when she needed them and could use the money far more than her so-called family, dot. But I'll deal with that later. For now, I just need some time to figure out what to do next, dot. After talking to my lawyer, I knew exactly what I had to do. The next time Sarah's family called, I finally answered. Her father, Richard, wasted no time and jumped straight to the point, pestering me about when I'd be handing over the money. He started rambling about how the debtors were hounding them relentlessly. But now, knowing what I knew, I decided to confront him. Richard, I interrupted, my voice steady. I've spoken to my lawyer and I know you faked all those papers just to get money out of me. There was dead silence on the other end of the line. Then, as expected, Richard started backpedaling. He tried to act confused and even went so far as to accuse me of losing my mind. But I wasn't backing down. I laid out everything I'd discovered and finally, he caved. He admitted to forging the documents. I could almost picture the look on his face as he realized the jig was up, dot. And then he had the nerve to switch gears and try to guilt trip me. He went on about how unfair it was that Sarah left most of her money to me instead of them. He argued that they deserved it more because they were the ones who raised her and made her the person she became, dot. The irony wasn't lost on me. The same people who had kicked her out and refused to support her were now trying to claim credit for her success. They didn't even reach out to her until years later when her first book started selling well. Sarah had been kind enough to let them back into her life even after everything they did to her. She welcomed them with open arms. And what did they do in return? They used her, draining money from her at every opportunity. I'm not giving you a single dollar more than what she already left you, I told him firmly. And I'm going to sue you for trying to scam me. You don't deserve a damn thing. I could hear Richard's fury through the phone. He started yelling, calling me selfish and heartless, but I didn't care. He could scream all he wanted. I just hung up, blocked their numbers, and contacted my lawyer to get the lawsuit rolling. They would pay for what they did, if not for the money, then for the way they tried to tarnish Sarah's memory, dot. The lawsuit was filed a few days later. When Sarah's family got served, they were livid. Instead of handling it quietly, they decided to pay me a visit at my house. I wasn't surprised. I'd expected them to try and bully me into dropping the case, dot. It was Richard and his wife Joyce who showed up. I didn't bother opening the door. I just yelled at them through the window to leave. But they weren't going anywhere. I could see them standing on my porch, huffing and puffing, like that would make me open the door. When they realized I wasn't coming out, Richard started banging on the door, demanding that I be a man, and talk to them face to face. Ethan, we need to talk this out like family, Joyce shouted, her voice shrill, dot, family. That word made me laugh. They were never family to me, and I sure as hell wasn't going to pretend now, Dot. After a few minutes of this nonsense, they switched tactics. Joyce put on her best grieving mother act, and started sobbing about how they were already mourning the loss of their daughter, and now, to make things worse, they were being dragged through a lawsuit over something as petty as money. Richard chimed in, pleading with me to think about the family and to stand by their side in this difficult time. I couldn't take it anymore. Leave now or I'll call the police, I told them coldly. I had no patience for their fake tears, dot, that set Joyce off. She launched into a long-winded lecture about family values, and how I should be honoring Sarah's memory by supporting her parents instead of attacking them. I let her rant for a bit, because it was almost funny to hear her talk about values when they'd never had any to begin with. But when she tried to guilt trip me again by saying I was disrespecting Sarah, I snapped. Disrespect, I spat, stepping closer to the door. The only people disrespecting Sarah are you two. You were never there for her, and now, just a few weeks after she's gone, you're already trying to scam her husband. If anyone's dishonoring her memory, it's you. Joyce flinched, but Richard looked like he was about to explode. You'll lose this case, Ethan, he growled. 
you're going to regret this. We'll see, I replied evenly. Now, leave. After a bit more grumbling and shouting, they finally stormed off, slamming the gate behind them. But I knew this wasn't over. They were going to fight me, and I had no intention of backing down, dot. The first hearing came sooner than I'd expected. Sitting across from them in a courtroom felt surreal. I knew Sarah wouldn't have wanted this. She would have hated the idea of her family and her husband fighting like this, but I had to remind myself that they brought this on themselves. They didn't leave me any choice, dot. Their lawyer was as sleazy as they were. He painted me as a manipulative husband who took advantage of Sarah's illness to control her assets. According to him, I brainwashed Sarah into signing her will, forcing her to leave most of her money to me and leaving her family with crumbs. I knew they would pull something like this, but it still infuriated me. They were trying to turn me into the villain, making it sound like I was some gold-digging husband who'd schemed to get his sick wife's money. The whole thing was absurd. But my lawyer was prepared. We had evidence, witnesses, and testimonies from people who actually knew Sarah, dot. The hearing was short, and we didn't get much resolved that day, but after we adjourned, Richard and Joyce approached me outside the courtroom. They tried one last time to convince me to drop the lawsuit. Richard even tried to offer me a deal, saying we could split the money if I backed off now. Are you really that desperate? I asked, genuinely curious. Think about it, he hissed. This doesn't have to get ugly. Just let us have what we're owed. Whatever you think you're owed, I replied slowly, is not mine to give, and with that I walked away. I didn't have time for their pathetic schemes. They could throw whatever lies they wanted at me in court, but I wasn't afraid. Eventually the truth would come out, and they'd be exposed for the liars they were, dot. The next couple of days were quiet. Too quiet. I knew they were up to something, but I didn't expect what happened next, dot. It was around midnight when I heard noises outside my house. At first I thought I was imagining things. I was exhausted and on edge, so I brushed it off and tried to go back to sleep. But then I heard glass shattering and a loud crash, followed by another dot. My heart started racing as I jumped out of bed and ran to the window. I looked outside and saw that all the windows of my neighbor's car had been smashed in. Someone had thrown rocks through every single one. I squinted and realized there were chalked messages scrawled on the rocks. Back off, they read in big white letters. I knew immediately who was behind it, dot. It was almost laughable. Sarah's brothers had come to vandalize my car but ended up targeting the wrong one. My car was safely parked in the garage, but my neighbor, Emily, a young single mother, had left hers outside. She'd only bought it a few weeks ago and was so proud of it. Now it was completely ruined. I ran outside just as Emily came out looking horrified. I quickly explained what had probably happened and apologized profusely, but she just shook her head. Don't worry about it, she said firmly. I'll press charges. And she did. By the time the police arrived, I'd already given them the address of Sarah's brothers. I went down to the station with Emily, who was determined to see this through. They were arrested within half an hour. Apparently they tried to resist and even made a pathetic attempt to escape through the fire escape. They were caught, obviously, and when they saw me they started screaming, blaming me for everything. I didn't say a word. I just watched as they were hauled away in cuffs, still shouting like lunatics. They were going to regret this, dot. After talking to my lawyer, I knew exactly what I had to do. The next time Sarah's family called, I finally answered. Her father, Richard, wasted no time and jumped straight to the point, pestering me about when I'd be handing over the money. He started rambling about how the debtors were hounding them relentlessly. But now, knowing what I knew, I decided to confront him. Richard, I interrupted, my voice steady. I've spoken to my lawyer, and I know you faked all those papers just to get money out of me. There was dead silence on the other end of the line. Then, as expected, Richard started backpedaling. He tried to act confused and even went so far as to accuse me of losing my mind. But I wasn't backing down. I laid out everything I'd discovered, and finally he caved. He admitted to forging the documents. I could almost picture the look on his face as he realized the jig was up, dot, and then he had the nerve to switch gears and try to guilt trip me. He went on about how unfair it was that Sarah left most of her money to me instead of them. He argued that they deserved it more because they were the ones who raised her and made her the person she became, dot. The irony wasn't lost on me. The same people who had kicked her out and refused to support her were now trying to claim credit for her success. They didn't even reach out to her until years later, when her first book started selling well. Sarah had been kind enough to let them back into her life, even after everything they did to her. 
She welcomed them with open arms, and what did they do in return? They used her, draining money from her at every opportunity. I'm not giving you a single dollar more than what she already left you, I told him firmly, and I'm going to sue you for trying to scam me. You don't deserve a damn thing. I could hear Richard's fury through the phone. He started yelling, calling me selfish and heartless, but I didn't care. He could scream all he wanted. I just hung up, blocked their numbers, and contacted my lawyer to get the lawsuit rolling. They would pay for what they did, if not for the money, then for the way they tried to tarnish Sarah's memory, dot, the lawsuit was filed a few days later. When Sarah's family got served, they were livid. Instead of handling it quietly, they decided to pay me a visit at my house. I wasn't surprised. I'd expected them to try and bully me into dropping the case, dot. It was Richard and his wife, Joyce, who showed up. I didn't bother opening the door. I just yelled at them through the window to leave, but they weren't going anywhere. I could see them standing on my porch, huffing and puffing like that would make me open the door. When they realized I wasn't coming out, Richard started banging on the door, demanding that I be a man and talk to them face to face. Ethan, we need to talk this out like family, Joyce shouted, her voice shrilled, dot, family. That word made me laugh. They were never family to me, and I sure as hell wasn't going to pretend now, dot. After a few minutes of this nonsense, they switched tactics. Joyce put on her best grieving mother act and started sobbing about how they were already mourning the loss of their daughter, and now, to make things worse, they were being dragged through a lawsuit over something as petty as money. Richard chimed in, pleading with me to think about the family and to stand by their side in this difficult time. I couldn't take it anymore. Leave now or I'll call the police, I told them coldly. I had no patience for their fake tears, dot. That set Joyce off. She launched into a long-winded lecture about family values and how I should be honoring Sarah's memory by supporting her parents instead of attacking them. I let her rant for a bit because it was almost funny to hear her talk about values when they'd never had any to begin with. But when she tried to guilt trip me again by saying I was disrespecting Sarah, I snapped. Disrespect? I spat, stepping closer to the door. The only people disrespecting Sarah are you two. You were never there for her, and now, just a few weeks after she's gone, you're already trying to scam her husband. If anyone's dishonoring her memory, it's you. Joyce flinched, but Richard looked like he was about to explode. You'll lose this case, Ethan, he growled. You're going to regret this. We'll see, I replied evenly. Now leave. After a bit more grumbling and shouting, they finally stormed off, slamming the gate behind them. But I knew this wasn't over. They were going to fight me, and I had no intention of backing down, dot. The first hearing came sooner than I'd expected. Sitting across from them in a courtroom felt surreal. I knew Sarah wouldn't have wanted this. She would have hated the idea of her family and her husband fighting like this. But I had to remind myself that they brought this on themselves. They didn't leave me any choice, dot. Their lawyer was as sleazy as they were. He painted me as a manipulative husband who took advantage of Sarah's illness to control her assets. According to him, I brainwashed Sarah into signing her will, forcing her to leave most of her money to me, and leaving her family with crumbs. I knew they would pull something like this, but it still infuriated me. They were trying to turn me into the villain, making it sound like I was some gold-digging husband who'd schemed to get his sick wife's money. The whole thing was absurd. But my lawyer was prepared. We had evidence, witnesses, and testimonies from people who actually knew Sarah, dot. The hearing was short, and we didn't get much resolved that day. But after we adjourned, Richard and Joyce approached me outside the courtroom. They tried one last time to convince me to drop the lawsuit. Richard even tried to offer me a deal, saying we could split the money if I backed off now. Are you really that desperate? I asked, genuinely curious. Think about it, he hissed. This doesn't have to get ugly. Just let us have what we're owed. Whatever you think you're owed, I replied slowly, is not mine to give. And with that, I walked away. I didn't have time for their pathetic schemes. They could throw whatever lies they wanted at me in court, but I wasn't afraid. Eventually the truth would come out, and they'd be exposed for the liars they were, dot. The next couple of days were quiet. Too quiet. I knew they were up to something, but I didn't expect what happened next, dot. It was around midnight when I heard noises outside my house. At first I thought I was imagining things. I was exhausted and on edge, so I brushed it off and tried to go back to sleep. But then I heard glass shattering in a loud crash, followed by another dot. My heart started racing as I jumped out of bed and ran to the window. I looked outside and saw that all the windows of my neighbor's car had been smashed in. 
someone had thrown rocks through every single one. I squinted and realized there were chalked messages scrawled on the rocks. Back off, they read in big white letters. I knew immediately who was behind it, dot. It was almost laughable. Sarah's brothers had come to vandalize my car but ended up targeting the wrong one. My car was safely parked in the garage, but my neighbor Emily, a young single mother, had left hers outside. She'd only bought it a few weeks ago and was so proud of it. Now it was completely ruined. I ran outside just as Emily came out, looking horrified. I quickly explained what had probably happened and apologized profusely, but she just shook her head. Don't worry about it, she said firmly. I'll press charges. And she did. By the time the police arrived, I'd already given them the address of Sarah's brothers. I went down to the station with Emily, who was determined to see this through. They were arrested within half an hour. Apparently they tried to resist and even made a pathetic attempt to escape through the fire escape. They were caught, obviously, and when they saw me they started screaming, blaming me for everything. I didn't say a word. I just watched as they were hauled away in cuffs, still shouting like lunatics. They were going to regret this. It's been three weeks since that night, and a lot has happened. I took Emily's car incident to court as additional evidence to show what kind of people Sarah's family truly were. With everything stacking up against them, they didn't stand a chance. Not only did they lose the lawsuit, but the judge also ordered them to give back the $75,000 that Sarah had left them in her will. On top of that, they were forced to pay for the damage to Emily's car, and Sarah's brothers now had a criminal record thanks to their ridiculous attempt at vandalism. I thought it would feel good to see them get what they deserved, but honestly I just felt drained. Winning the lawsuit didn't bring Sarah back. It didn't undo all the pain they caused me or erase the fact that they tried to paint Sarah as a liar. But at least it was over, dot. They haven't tried contacting me since the judgment was passed, and I'm hoping that means I've finally heard the last of them. Good riddance, honestly. I can finally breathe again without looking over my shoulder, wondering what their next move will be. Now that the money is back in my hands, I've been thinking about what to do with it. I'm not going to keep it, that much is certain. I have more than enough from what Sarah left me, and I don't want to hold on to anything that was tainted by her family's greed, dot. Instead, comma, I decided to give it to the people who truly deserved it, the ones who were there for Sarah when she needed support the most. I started with Anna, Sarah's secretary. She worked tirelessly for years, even when Sarah was too sick to keep up with her projects. She handled everything without ever asking for anything in return. When I offered her a portion of the money, she refused at first. She said she couldn't take it, but I knew Sarah would have wanted her to have it, so I insisted until she finally accepted. Next was Lily. She's always been a happy go lucky woman, the kind of person who can light up a room just by being in it. Every weekend she would drive two hours just to visit Sarah in the hospital, even though she had a full time job and a family of her own to look after. She never once complained, she just showed up, bringing with her a smile and a bag of Sarah's favorite snacks. I'll never forget how Sarah's face would light up whenever she saw Lily walk through the door. Dot. When I handed Lily the check, she broke down in tears. The only other time I'd ever seen her cry like that was at Sarah's funeral. She tried to refuse, of course, but I wasn't having it. I made it clear that this was a gift from both me and Sarah, a small token of gratitude for everything she did. It took some convincing, but eventually she accepted, wiping away her tears and hugging me tightly, dot. The rest of the money went to a few other friends who had stood by Sarah and me through the hardest times. I made sure to include everyone who had been there for us, no matter how small their role might have seemed. They were the ones who deserved to be remembered in Sarah's will, not her selfish, conniving family, dot. It took a while to get everything sorted out, but when it was finally done, I felt lighter, like I'd finally done something right after weeks of dealing with all the chaos her family had caused. I hope, wherever Sarah is, that she's smiling. This is what she would have wanted, dot. Even though things have calmed down, I can't say I've fully moved on. Some nights I still wake up expecting to see Sarah beside me, only to remember that she's gone, but I'm doing my best to take it one day at a time, dot. Just when I thought I was finally out of the woods, I got a call from Sarah's parents. They hadn't spoken to me since they lost the lawsuit, and I figured they were just trying to lick their wounds. But this call wasn't about them trying to apologize or make amends. No. They were angrier than ever. Ethan, you're going to regret suing us, Richard snarled over the phone. I could practically feel his hatred through the line. We're going to make sure you pay for this. Is that a threat? I asked, keeping my voice calm. Because if it is, I'd be happy to report it to the police, he scoffed. You really think you can get rid of us that easily? 
we'll see how smug you are when we're through with you. I didn't even bother responding. I just hung up and blocked their number again. But I couldn't shake the feeling that this wasn't the end. They were planning something and I had no idea what. The very next day, I found out exactly what they were up to. I was at the bookstore sorting through some new stock when I got a call from my lawyer. Apparently, Richard and Joyce had decided to sue me for emotional distress and were demanding compensation for the mental anguish I'd caused them by taking back the inheritance. I nearly laughed when I heard it. They were really that desperate. But I couldn't just ignore it, no matter how ridiculous it was. So we went back to court again. This time, it wasn't as cut and dry. They spun the story to make themselves look like victims, claiming that I'd harassed them, that I'd used my influence and Sarah's money to bully them. They even tried to bring up the car incident, saying that I'd set Sarah's brothers up to make them look bad. It was a complete circus and I felt sick just listening to them twist the truth like that dot. But comma, just like before, we had the facts on our side. My lawyer brought forward every single piece of evidence we had from the first lawsuit, plus a few new testimonies from people who knew what had really happened. One by one, every lie they tried to sell was shot down. By the end of it, they looked more pathetic than ever, but they still refused to back down. I knew then that they weren't going to stop until I put them in their place once and for all. So when the judge dismissed their case, I decided to take things a step further. I filed a restraining order against the entire family, barring them from coming within 100 feet of me or contacting me in any way. If they violated it, I'd have grounds to press charges. And if there's one thing I know, it's that Richard and Joyce are cowards. They'd never risk getting arrested, not after what happened with their sons. After that day, I finally felt a sense of peace. I didn't have to worry about them showing up at my door again or trying to pull some new scheme to harass me. For the first time since Sarah died, I felt like I could finally breathe. I wish it hadn't come to this. I wish Sarah's family could have just left me alone to grieve in peace. But they made their choice, and now they were paying the price for it. I hope they stay far away from me and never try to contact me again. I'm done with them for good. It's been a few weeks since I last heard from Sarah's family, and I've finally started to feel like I'm getting my life back on track. I'm still running the bookstore, and it's been keeping me busy, which helps a lot. I've started focusing on some new projects, things I never had the time or energy for before. In a way, it feels like I'm rebuilding myself piece by piece stuff, but just when I thought I was done dealing with the madness, Sarah's brothers decided to make one last attempt to mess with me. It was late one night, around 2 a.m., when I heard a loud thud coming from the backyard. I was half asleep but immediately on edge. After everything that's happened, I don't take any strange noises lightly anymore. I grabbed my phone and crept downstairs, keeping as quiet as I could. When I peeked out the back window, I saw two figures sneaking around near the shed. One of them was carrying a crowbar. It didn't take a genius to figure out what was going on. I dialed 911 and stayed inside, watching them from the shadows. Within minutes, two squad cars rolled up, lights flashing silently in the dark. The intruders must have panicked and they saw the red and blue lights because they started scrambling, trying to make a run for it. But it was too late. The officers caught them before they could even make it to the fence. Dot. As the cops cuffed them and dragged them out into the driveway, I stepped outside and got a good look at their faces. Sure enough, it was Mike and James, Sarah's brothers. They looked like a pair of kids caught stealing candy from a store. Mike's face was beat red with anger and James kept his head down, avoiding my gaze. The officers led them over to me and I could see the fury in Mike's eyes as he glared at me. This is all your fault, he spat, struggling against the handcuffs. You took everything from us. I just stared at him, unblinking. You did this to yourselves. Now you're going to face the consequences. He lunged at me, but the officers yanked him back before he could get close. James didn't say a word, just kept staring at the ground like he couldn't believe what was happening. The cops hauled them off to the station and I followed to file a report. Turns out they'd planned to break into my shed and vandalize it, probably to send some sort of message. They didn't even have a plan beyond that, just wanted to destroy something of mine because they felt like I'd ruined their lives. It was pathetic. I pressed charges and the restraining order I'd filed made things worse for them. Now they were looking at actual jail time. By the time I got home, the sun was starting to rise. I sat on the porch, watching the sky turn shades of pink and orange, and for the first time in what felt like forever, I felt a sense of calm. Dot. That was the last time I had to deal with them. Dot. The brothers pled guilty to avoid a harsher sentence and both of them got a few months in jail. It wasn't much, but it was enough to keep them out of my life for a while. 
Richard and Joyce didn't even bother showing up to the hearings. They knew they'd lost that with them finally out of the picture. I've been able to focus on moving forward. I've been pouring my energy into the bookstore and it's been paying off. Sales are up and I've even started planning some renovations. I think Sarah would be proud. It's funny, when all this started, I felt so lost. After Sarah's death, I didn't know who I was without her, but now I'm beginning to see that I'm stronger than I thought. I stood up to the people who tried to tear me down. I fought for Sarah's memory, for her honor, and I didn't let them win. I still think about Sarah every day. There are moments when I miss her so much that it physically hurts, but I know she wouldn't want me to spend the rest of my life mourning. So I'm taking things one step at a time, learning how to live again. A few days ago, I found one of Sarah's old journals while cleaning out some boxes in the attic. It was filled with story ideas she'd never had the chance to write. Reading through it, I could almost hear her voice again, full of excitement and hope for the future. It made me smile. I think someday I'll try to finish some of those stories for her, not for publication or anything, just for myself. It's a small way to keep her spirit alive. As for her family, I'm done wasting time on them. They've taken up enough space in my life and I refuse to let them have any more. I heard from my lawyer that Richard and Joyce are struggling to make ends meet now that they don't have Sarah's money to rely on. It's poetic justice in a way, but I'm not interested in revenge. I just want them to stay away from me. I hope wherever they are, they learn to let go of their greed and move on. My life is finally my own again. Dot. This morning I went for a walk through the park, something I haven't done in ages. It was quiet and peaceful, with the early morning sun filtering through the trees. For the first time in a long time, I felt, content. I don't know what the future holds, but I think I'm ready to find out. Sarah's gone, but the love and strength she gave me are still here, and that's enough. I'll always carry her with me, no matter what, dot. And as for everything else? Well, I'm just going to take it day by day and see where life leads me. Maybe I'll travel, maybe I'll pick up some new hobbies, or maybe I'll just keep focusing on the bookstore. Whatever I do, I'm going to live fully, the way Sarah would have wanted me to. Hit that subscribe button now, or you'll be the one asking, wait, what did I miss, while everyone else is cracking up.